Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to another beginner's Dart tutorial video. Today we're going to continue to look at inheritance in classes. We'll be looking at abstract classes. We'll be looking at things like casting. We'll look at mix-ins and we'll look at interfaces. We'll also look at some small things like the switch statement and we'll talk about importing libraries. As we've seen, classes are a way of defining a blueprint for an object. However, classes are not just a way of defining solitary objects. They can be used to define a complex relationship between multiple different objects, and these connections can help us define parts of our program. Objects do not need to be of the same class for us to know at compile time whether or not they share certain attributes, and inheritance, abstract classes, interfaces, and mix-ins are some of the techniques inside of Dart that allow us to specify various relationships between objects and their interfaces. So first let's define what's called an abstract class called shape. An abstract class is a class that doesn't allow us to instantiate any objects from it. Now the main reason why you'd use an abstract class is so that you can essentially create an interface for other classes to implement. So in this case, our interface has three getter methods inside of it. We have a perimeter method, an area method, and then we have a name method. And the idea is that any class that inherits from this shape class will also have, at the very least, these three functions inside of it. It's also important to note that while you can define how things work inside of an abstract class, you do not necessarily have to. I'm not specifically defining what these getters are getting. Instead, I'm just defining that they exist. I'm just saying, okay, well, there's a getter called perimeter that returns a double. There's a getter called area that also returns a double. And then there's also a getter called name, which returns a string. Let's start by creating a circle class, which extends shape. As you can see here, we're getting an error for this class denoted by these red squiggly lines under the name circle. And if I click on it and then I click this light bulb here, I can then implement the three missing overrides, which are the methods defined here. So now circle implements the interface for the shape class. Because we're creating a circle, we're gonna need a radius. And with this radius, we'll also use the constructor to get the radius. And actually, before we continue implementing the perimeter and area for the circle, let's go ahead and import the Dart math library so that we can gain access to the pi constant. The area formula for a circle is just pi times r squared. And we can, of course, create this formula by using that pi constant, which we just brought in from the math library, and multiplying it by the radius times the radius. Then for the perimeter, it's just 2 times pi r. We take the radius, multiply it by 2, and then again multiply it by pi. And then finally, we can finish off this circle class by giving it a name, which will just be a string that says, I'm a circle with a radius using string interpolation. Let's go ahead and now create another class, which we'll call rectangle, which again will extend the shape abstract class. Like with circle, we want to override the interface functions for the shape abstract class. Unlike circle, we want to have two fields inside of our rectangle, length and width, both of which are double. And we can write them on a single line like this because both are the same type. You just say double length comma width. Then we'll create our constructor, which will take in length and then width. And now we can go ahead and implement the overrides. So for area, we just multiply length times width. Then for name, we are just going to say, I'm a rectangle with length, followed by the length number, and then width, followed by the width number. And then for perimeter, we'll take the length, multiply by two, and then add it to the width, multiply by two. Finally, let's create a class called square. Now with square, we could go ahead and extend the shape abstract class like we did with the rectangle and with the circle. But because a square is actually just a rectangle where all of these sides are equal, we can actually further decrease the amount of code that we need to use to implement this square by extending a rectangle rather than a shape. When we extend a normal class, 
we just need to implement the constructor and then we get all of the interface from the normal class automatically. With square, we have the constructor where we're passing in a length and a width property, which are automatically now attached to square because of rectangle. We can make this much easier though, just by replacing both length and width with a single value called side, which will also be a double. And then we can take and put side in for length and for width inside of our rectangle constructor. We don't need to override area and perimeter because they'll be exactly the same as rectangle, but we should override the name getter. And in this case, we're just gonna override it and we're gonna say I am a square with the side of, and then I'll just put in length because remember our side is equal to both length and width. So you could put in length or width and you'd get exactly the same number. Now, of course, we can go ahead and instantiate all of these objects. So here we have a square, a rectangle, and a circle, and all of them have various values inside of them. And then we just go ahead and print out the name of each of these. And of course, we get back the predictable behavior. We just get back that I'm a square with a side of 10.0, then I'm a rectangle with a length of 20.0 and a width of 15.0, and then I'm a circle with a radius of 2.0. Now if we want to, we can take this a little further, I mentioned before that we cannot instantiate an abstract class object, but we can still use the abstract class as a type. So here I'm saying that I want to define a variable that is of type shape. And the interesting thing about doing this is that any of our other three classes that extend the type shape can actually go into this variable. So I could put a circle, a rectangle, or a square in here, and the compiler will not complain because all of them implement the interface of the shape type. So let's go ahead and make a fairly contrived example. Here I'm gonna create a random number generator by using the random object from our math library, which we imported before. And then I'll make it so that this random number generator generates an integer between zero and two by calling random next integer and then passing in three. Now the reason this gives us between zero and two is because we start at zero and then we count up. So it would just be zero, one, two. Now with this random number generator, we can pair it with a switch statement. And this is a logical control flow statement which allows us to change the code that we wanna run based on a certain value. And that value in this case is the choice value. So what we're saying is, if choice matches one of our cases, then execute the code inside of that case. If choice is equal to zero, then we'll create a circle and the radius inside of the circle will be a random number between zero and nine. And of course it needs to be a double. And because we're getting back an integer from this method call, we can just add 1.0 to that integer and that will convert it into a double. If choice equals one, then we'll create a rectangle. And again, length and width will be random numbers between zero and nine. And then if choice equals two, then we'll create a square where the side is a random integer. Notice we also have these break statements after every single one of the cases. And we also have this default case. The break statements are required inside of a switch statement because of the way that the control flow actually works inside of the switch statement. So we only want one of these cases to execute and with the break keyword, we then break out of the switch statement. So if choice matches at case zero, then it will execute this code and then it will leave the switch statement entirely. If it doesn't match zero and it matches one, then it will execute this code and then break out of the switch statement. And again, if it doesn't match zero or one, but it matches two, then it will execute this code. And then finally, if it doesn't match any of our cases, it will execute the default code. And because we know that choice needs to be a value between zero and two, let's finish this example by printing out the random shape's name, area, and perimeter. So here you can see I ran the code and we got a circle with a radius of 7.0. I can execute it a few more times until we get a random number that will give us a square. And as you can see here, the square has a side of 10.0.
And then I can run it a few more times to get a rectangle. And coincidentally, this rectangle has both the same length and the same width. As we've mentioned a few times before, Dart's inheritance model is what's called a single inheritance model, as opposed to a multiple inheritance model. This means that you can only include one other class using the extend keyword. In other words, you can only have one inherited class on your other class. However, Dart provides several ways that you can append attributes from other classes to a different class. One of the ways that we can do this is by way of the implements keyword. With every class in Dart, we expose a specific interface which we can reuse and this of course includes abstract classes. So we can therefore use this interface and implement it on any other classes. So here we have a class A where the interface is just a method called hello, which is void and takes in no parameters. Then for class B, we have a method called hi, which is again void and takes in no parameters. So when we use the implements keyword on class C, and we implement both A and B, we are just telling C that we want to have a method called hello, which is void and takes in no parameters from A, and then a method called hi, which is from B. The only real requirement for the implements keyword is that the class that is using the implements keyword implement the entire interface of the class that it's implementing. So every method, property, and instance variable must be declared inside of this new class. So for instance, if I extend class B to have a property called B, and then I give it a constructor for B, and then I add a goodbye method, which just takes and prints out bye-bye and then the string B, you'll see here that C will now have an error. And we can go ahead and fix this error by overriding the string property B and then the method for goodbye. And in the case of C, what I'll do is I'll just create a constructor here that will take in this.b and then I'll just print out goodbye like we had with our B class. It'll just say bye bye and then put in the string for B. You can do some fairly interesting things with these classes that we just created. For instance, I can go ahead and declare a type A called C, which is a object of C type. So even though this is a C object, it will be treated like the type A. So as you can see here, I can call C.hello because this is part of the A's class interface, but I can't call C.goodbye and C.hi because both of these are not implemented by class A. And to prove that this is in fact a C class, even though it's being treated like an A class, if I run the application, you can see that we get back the string hello from C. Now say we do want to make this work, we can use what's called casting. And casting is a way for us to indicate to the compiler that we want to treat an object of some type like another type with a compatible interface. So in the case of our C object type, which is acting like an A type, we can call c.hello because this is acting like an A type. And then we can use this as keyword to cast it as a B type so that we can call the goodbye method. And then again, we can cast it as a C type so that we can call the hi method on it. And of course, even though we're casting this as a B here, it will still act like a actual C object. All this really does for us is allow us to actually call the goodbye method. And actually, if I go ahead and cast it as C instead of a B, this will still work because both C and B implement both of these methods. And as you can see here, we get hello from C, bye bye from C, and then hi from C because this is all from a C object. You can use casting for any type that implements a comparable interface, as I mentioned before, and it can be pretty useful for various different pieces inside of Dart. Now let's create another class here. I'm going to call it timestamp. 
This will have a date time time object attached to it where we just call date time now to get the current timestamp. And then we'll be able to print out this timestamp by calling print stamp. We can use this class to create what's called a mixin. Mixins are another way of appending attributes from one class to another without using inheritance. Unlike classes that implement interfaces, classes that use mixins do not need to redefine the behavior of the original class that they are mixing in. Also, instead of the implements keyword, we use the keyword with to denote that we're adding a class as a mixin. Now, the class that's being used as a mixin must meet certain requirements. First, the class must have no declared constructors. Second, the class must not be a subclass of anything other than object. In other words, it can't use the extends keyword. And then finally, it must have no calls to the super keyword, which it won't if it doesn't inherit anything. So now we can come down here to our class C and add the with keyword followed by the timestamp class to the class C. And as you can see, we don't actually have to change any of the behavior inside of C. And once we've done that, we can go ahead and take our A C type and cast it as a C. And that will allow us to automatically just call the print stamp method directly on our C type. And as you can see here, we get all of the method calls from the C object type as though it was an actual C. And then of course we get a timestamp. The main convenience of this style of programming is essentially just code reuse. If we wanted to add timestamps to a bunch of objects, then it makes sense to use a mixin rather than rewrite the method over and over and over again. The same goes for class inheritance and also for things like casting and for interfaces in general. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this tutorial, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.